Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm sure that there will be more people joining us as we go, um, but we want to get sure, make sure that we get as much of the information in as we possibly can during this time frame. Uh, welcome. We're glad to have you all with us. Uh, the cooperation between the International Law Students Association and ASIL is a very valuable one to us, and we're very excited that we were able to offer the free membership to the graduates of the Jessup competition this year. Uh, and we hope that you've been taking advantage of that membership. My name is Wes Rist. I am the Director of Education and Research here at the American Society of International Law. Uh, for those of you who don't know, ASIL is a 110-year-old professional membership association, primarily for international lawyers, but there are others involved. And we have a lot of interdisciplinary things that we do, and, and some folks from outside of the legal discipline get involved with us. Uh, but we focus on education um, for the general public, for the legal community, for judges, for policymakers on international law topics. Uh, we're nonprofit and non advocacy, which means that the only stance we take on international law is that it's a better tool for resolving uh, disputes than armed conflict. Um, anything other than that, and we work really hard to, uh, to make sure that we are. Um, providing information and resources to the international law community without coloring it with our perspectives. Um, we also very actively support the development of new professionals in international law. A lot of our more senior members got their starts by people who mentored them from the society, uh, and they are now in the position where they're encouraging others to pursue international law as a career. So professional development for both new professionals and students is very important to us. In fact, roughly 25% of our members identify as students or new professionals. We even have an entire interest group that's dedicated to new professionals that puts on events and programming and, and uh, pursues that as an option for students and new professionals to learn more about a career in international law. Today we're going to be going through a very hands-on skills-focused workshop about how to pursue an international law career and what you can do, even if you're currently in a job that's not international law focused, to obtain the skills, the experience, and the qualifications that you need to apply for those jobs. Um, first, I'd like to start off by reminding you all, uh, you can email any questions that you have throughout the event to events at ASOL.org, and that's going to be on the slides uh, periodically as well. Um, but feel free to do that at any time that you have questions. I would also ask that if you're watching right now that you go ahead and send an email with your name, where you obtained your degree from, um, and what kind of international law you are interested in. That will help me give some targeted feedback at the end of the discussion um, so I can address specific fields uh, because there are occasionally things that differ if you're interested in, let's say, uh, working on public international law as opposed to working on private international law at a firm or something like that. Um, so if you could send an email to events at ASIL.org with your name, where you obtained your degree from, and uh, your, if you have a specific area of international law in which you are interested in pursuing a career, let us know that as well. Um, to that end, we're going to get started with uh, this. The slides that I am showing you now um, will actually be sent around to everyone who responds to that email. So when we get your email address that you participated, we'll send this around, these slides around as well so you can view them at your leisure. Um, so, uh, the, the basics that we've got to start off with are there are things that you can do in your career to prepare for whatever, or in your day-to-day -day life, that you can prepare for a career in international law. Um, and it's important to note that these skills are things that no matter what you are doing, uh, you can be, um, you can be working on these. So today we're going to talk about the following items. We're going to talk about languages. We're going to talk about your resume target list, and I'll explain what that means. We're going to talk about your job application skills, and we're going to talk about networking. Now, that's a lot of stuff to cover in an hour, so we're going to have to move very quickly through some of these things. But please do make sure that you're sending in questions as we've got, and we'll leave some time at the end specifically for questions as well. But let's start off very quickly with languages. Um, it is still possible to have a single language and pursue a career in international law. Um, most of you, as ILSA graduate or as ILSA participants, have probably been um, have probably have additional language skills already. Um, but there there is no uh, difficulty with going after a second language skill if you already if you only have English. Um, since we're in English, that I would assume that's your language skill, uh, your mother tongue. Um, 
There are certainly, however, many more jobs that open up if you have a second language. Uh, and it's important to know how to evaluate what languages to go after if you're deciding to learn a second or even a third or fourth language. Um, some of the things that are really important to note is that if you've got pre-existing skills, please, please don't do what I did, which is have four years of Spanish and then go to college and decide, oh, I'm going to study German for some reason. And now I remember like four words of German and my Spanish is only moderately good. Um, you use the pre-existing skills that you have to ramp them up to a level of fluency. And, and this is another very important part. Fluency is what is required here. You need to be able to um, demonstrate that you are professionally fluent in a language. If you're using a language skill to get hired, they're not hiring you to be able to speak to the bus driver or the grocery store clerk or the taxi cab driver. They are hiring you to write, to read, and to um, put together uh, presentations or, or oral communication on a professional level in that language. Um, so it is not simply a it's not simply a, yes, I can speak with other people in this country. It is a professional level of fluency, and that's really important. Um, it's also important when you're evaluating the time, the, the languages that you want to pursue, to know how much time it would require. So the link that I've included on this slide is a link to a place that breaks down by family of languages, what family of language they come from, how long in full-time study, in weeks, it takes to prepare. Um, and this is really surprising when you start looking at it. So for a native English speaker, and this is for native English speakers, this language chart on time needed to learn is for native English speakers. Um, but for native English speakers, learning a romance language um, can be done relatively quickly um, to a professional level of fluency comparatively. Um, but learning some of the languages that are very divergent from how English works can be much longer, including up to and over a year of full-time study, and even that won't necessarily get you to professional fluency. So when you're thinking about what languages to pursue, make sure you're thinking about the time you're going to have to invest to get that to a professional fluency level. Also, if you know, for example, that you're interested in working in Latin America, uh, if you know that you really are focused on Asia, then you can focus in on languages that are relevant to that geographic area, of course. Um, some areas of need have subject uh, are some subject matters have specific languages that are relevant to them. So if you're interested in national security or international security, um, Russian, Chinese, Arabic, all of these are very relevant. If you're interested in international trade and economics, um, Asia is a huge and growing market and, and there are many opportunities if you speak any of the number of languages from that part of the world. Uh, so evaluate and research um, based on the subject matter that you're interested in, find out if there are languages that are relevant. And we'll talk about a better way to specifically identify those language skills and which ones should be pursued when we also talk about ways that you can identify the skills and experience that you need for your jobs. So um, now we're going to talk about this quite frequently throughout this discussion, but what we have here is a list of what's called a resume target list. Um, and this is very important because one of the essential elements of getting a job is looking like the candidate that they want. And the way that you do that is you look at job descriptions. So when was the last time you actually looked at a job description? Now, some of you may actually be applying for jobs right now, so you're neck deep in them, and that's fantastic. Um, but it's really important to actually take a step back and look at job descriptions as a whole, not just the, the jobs that you want to apply for, not just the ones that you say, this is exactly what I want to be doing, so I'm going to submit an application for this job. You should also be looking at the job descriptions that are related to your field or that are at places where you don't want to work because of the geographic location or maybe the ideology of the body or just the pay isn't very good or whatever it might be um, that you're not considering actually applying there. But the information that's contained in that job description is incredibly valuable to you. So job descriptions are a specialized form of communication. You need to learn how to read job descriptions. It is not intuitive. Um, job descriptions that are written for legal jobs are often written either by lawyers who are very bad at writing job descriptions. Um, that's just a fact. Lawyers write terrible job descriptions. Or they're written by human resources personnel who don't actually know the legal requirements for the job that they're doing. So some lawyer sent them a list of things, skills, experiences, qualifications, and said, this is what we want. And then a human resources person whose job it is to solicit applications put that into a job description. 
So you're already working through filters that can make it difficult to understand what the company actually wants, what the employer actually wants. Um, to better guide you, we strongly recommend um, that you pull together a list of 25 to 30 job descriptions. Again, these are not jobs that you need to necessarily want to apply to right away. These may be jobs that you have no interest in actually pursuing for very specific reasons. But if they are jobs that the subject matter is related to the kind of international law that you want to be doing, then that's a valid uh, candidate for inclusion in this list. So you want to pull together this um, collection of job descriptions because you're going to use them as a sample size. You're going to use them as a guideline for the skills that you need to be pursuing in your own career. Um, and of course, one of the most important things is learning the language of the field. Hiring staff use jargon and their own vocabulary to sift out um, through the hundreds of job applications. So when you're applying, you need to use the language that the job description has used. And if they use certain terminology, make sure that you use the same terminology. Um, don't be thinking about this in terms of how can I reword this to make them impressed with my language skills. Use the phrases they use, use the terms they use, use the jargon they use, make sure that you understand what those things mean, um, and then incorporate them into your resumes and your cover letters. And that's really important because I don't have time as an employer who's looking at hundreds of potential job applications, I don't have time to be thinking, okay, what do they mean by this? Is this skill the same as the skill that I asked for? Is this experience the same kind of experience that I asked about? I want someone who's done that for me, who's put it in the language that I used when I put the job out there. So you're going to pull this list of um, potential uh, job opportunities together, and you're going to coordinate on this. You're going to put um, you're going to put together a uh, spreadsheet um, is what I use when I do this, or or you can use a, a Word document with lists or anything like that. Um, but you're going to start collecting information on what these jobs are looking for. What does this look like um, in terms of a, uh, a substantive request for potential candidates? So today we're actually going to tear apart a job description. We're going to take a real job description that's online right now. In fact, the deadline is, I think, August 15th for this job description. So this is a job that someone out there might actually apply to if you look at it and say, hey, I like this and I'm qualified. This is for a legal and program officer at the Equal Rights Trust. Um, and I've included the link for this uh, position. It's on AWID, um, which is one of those organizations that used to have a name but now just has letters. Um, but they have a great uh, public interest job board. So you should absolutely include them on the list of, excuse me, the list of places where you look for jobs. Um, so uh, one of the most basic things you need to know about tearing apart a job description and understanding what's actually in there is that every job description, every single one of them, will have these three items included. They will have qualifications, they will have skills, and they will have experience requirements. Um, they may not actually call them that. They may just say desired um, re requirements or desired skills or something like that. But they are all clearly identifiable as these three categories. Qualifications are the big checkbox items. Um, skills are learned and developed capabilities. And experience can either be time and position or a shorthand for skills or sometimes both. And we'll talk about each of these in more detail. And we'll look at the job description here and what it actually includes for these um, skills and experiences and qualifications. So um, this is the job announcement from Equal Rights Trust. Uh, deadline is August 15th. The, the company is in London. Um, the position is the legal and programs officer. Uh, and there you can see the actual description of the, the position. It supports the, lit the trust's litigation, research, advocacy, and movement building work, man work and manages a number of its grant funded projects. Um, you work with the trust co-director, um, you'll be required to coordinate delivery of a number of the trust's international projects and to research draft and legal submissions and reports, um, et cetera. And this is a human rights focused uh, in organization. Um, and uh, the first step when you're looking at jobs to evaluate should they be included in your list and when you're looking at them to say, should I apply to this, um, is make sure you want this job. I, I honestly cannot tell you how many of my former students that I have had who have said, you know what, I got this job, I'm, I'm here for six months and I really can't wait to leave. And I'm like, but I thought this was the perfect job for you. And they're like, yeah, but 
what I actually do day to day is not what I thought I was going to do. I thought I was going to work on this part of what they asked for or this part of what I know this organization for. And my day to day job is very different. So there's always going to be a section that, that conveys the duties and responsibilities of the job. And you want to make sure you read this very carefully to make sure that it's actually a job that you want to do, that it's something that you look at and say, yes, this is, an, this is the kind of work that I want to do in my professional development in my career. Um, now, that may be because it's what you're passionate about. It may also be because it's a job that's going to give you skills and experience that you need to apply for a new job. Um, so sometimes jobs are stepping stones onto future career options. So make sure that you're carefully evaluating, is this job going to give me what I want, either because I'm passionate about the work or because it's giving me the skills and the experience I need to move on. Um, so this is the job description for this position. Um, and we mentioned it already, but you, you have a very limited kind of understanding of what this is about. There is, however, a little bit more, and we'll get to that later in the slideshows, um, about what the day-to-day -day work is. But make sure that even just the big ticket item here up front matches with what you're interested in. Um, specifically, you're going to be doing a lot of coordination on the delivery of their projects, research and draft, legal submissions and reports. Um, you're going to be working on human rights issues, um, things like that. Uh, so make sure that those check off boxes that you're interested in. Um, now, qualifications. We talked about this a little bit, but I wanted to mention this because these are checkbox items. These are big things that once you have them, um, you rarely need to get them again. This may be an LLB or a JD or an LLM or a PhD. Um, but once you have them, usually you don't need to go back and do anything about them. Um, also, there are, I routinely get questions, and in fact, from one of the people who, um, who wrote in, uh, Magdalena wrote and asked, how important is an LLM degree, especially for law students from other than common law countries? Um, and the answer is, and it's a favorite lawyer's answer, is it depends. Um, the reality is, I can't tell you the right answer to that because certain jobs may value that very highly, others may not care about it at all. Um, and certainly different career paths may evaluate that differently. The best way for you to figure out, should I go after an LLM? Should I go after a PhD? Um, should I get a joint degree of some kind, like a um, master's in international affairs or global health or business admin or something like that? The best way to figure that out is to have a collection of 25 or 30 job descriptions that you've looked at. And you say, you know what? This is the career path that I want to go down. And I've looked at these 30 job descriptions and only five of them actually ask for an LLM. Well, in that case, no, an LLM isn't worth it. You shouldn't spend your time on it. Sometimes, though, you'll go through and you'll look at this and they'll say, boy, 20 out of the 30 of these want someone who's got an advanced degree of some kind. I need something. I need some kind of advanced degree. Otherwise, I'm not going to be qualified for the positions that I actually want to be pursuing. Um, so the best way to evaluate whether you need a specific kind of degree is to actually be looking at the um, the job descriptions for the positions that you're interested in and evaluating them at that time and saying, okay, I can do this. I can go and get this kind of advanced degree before I start my job search so that I know I'll be qualified right from the beginning. Um, now, it's important to remember that this may change as your career goes on. You may have to look at these several different times uh, to evaluate, okay, I've been in my current job for five years. I'm getting ready to move. Do I need anything different? Has this changed? Do I need to go back to school? Um, it's Thankfully, in the legal field, it's not often the case that that's true. Um, but if you're changing into something that's only partly legal or you're getting into the business side or entrepreneurial work or something like that, you may find that you now have need of an MBA or, or something equivalent to that. So you constantly have to reevaluate this. Thankfully, for those of us in the legal profession, it's usually not a big deal. Um, now, some very specific, uh, if you look here, um, this is the essential skills and experiences. Uh, I just wanted to give you a sense of what they're asking for overall because um, this is the list of what they want, essential skills and desirable skills. So I want you to see on this list, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight required and one, two, three, four, five um, desirable. So there's a total of 13 uh, items that they will be evaluating you on, 13 metrics that they're going to be looking at and saying, do you fit my standards for this? Um, and it's really important when you're talking about qualifications to remember that your qualifications are usually one entry 
on a job description. Usually there's one line that says, has an LLM, has a JD, has an LLB, whatever it might be. Um, one of my first mentors uh, used to say this all the time, and it's a really valid point, but your transcript gets you a diploma, your resume gets you a job. So make sure you're thinking about it. If you happen to still be in law school, make sure you're thinking about what can I be doing while I'm in law school to be setting myself up for a good uh, resume, to make sure that I look like a good candidate. So let's look at this one. On this particular uh, application for this legal and programs officer, um, there are two entries on this. One is an undergrad or graduate degree in law, so a first degree in law preferred um, with social sciences or another relevant discipline as an option. Um, but for our purposes, considering most of you are law grads or, or going to be law grads, great. We've got an undergrad or a graduate degree in law. That's fairly straightforward. It doesn't even require an LLM. Fantastic. Under desirable skills, we have legal qualification, which means the right to practice law. So in the US, that would be being admitted to the bar of a state. In other countries, that would mean complying with whatever the national regulation is to have the right to appear in front of court. Um, now, this is a position based in the UK. Um, so the legal qualification there might be on the solicitor side or the barrister side. They don't specify. Um, so there are two out of the 13 on this list that are qualifications. And this is important because that means that 11 more of these actually require you to develop skills and experience before you're going to qualify for this job. So we're going to talk about how you can go about doing that, whether you're currently in law school or whether you've graduated and are just trying to find a job to pay the bills to start off with. So the next item we'll talk about is skills. Um, skills are one of these things that they can be, depending on how well the job description is written, they can sometimes be as vague and as useless, to be honest, as research and writing, um, which is probably the most uh, useless skill of any job description because what kind of research and what kind of writing? Those are two very different things, and there are many, many different styles within the overall heading of research and writing that you can be good at. You may be great at legislative drafting, but not good at opinion writing. Or you may be fantastic at producing memos for partners, um, but you've never done any kind of op-ed piece or, or journal article or anything like that. So it's really important to know the differences there. And unfortunately, you'll often get a lot of, oh, research and writing, and that's what we want. And that's not a great help. Um, but sometimes it's very specific. So you can see a, a skill that asks for knowledge of comparative legislative drafting on global health issues in small island developing states. Fantastic. That's a very specific skill. That's equally as useless because you're going to see one job in your entire life that has that as a skill. Um, so it's really difficult for anyone to be able to say, yes, I'm going to spend all of my time prepping for that one thing. I'm going to learn comparative legislation. I'm going to learn legislative drafting. I'm going to learn global health issues. I'm going to study everything I can about small island developing states. And then you're qualified for a single job. And if you don't get that job, if someone else gets it, then you're out of luck because none of your qualifications translate to the others. So what you're looking for is skills that you can parse into larger categories so that you can address them generally without being too broad. So you want something that's not as specific as comparative legislative on drafting on global health issues in small island developing states, but that's not as broad as research and writing. So to pull from the example in the first bullet there, um, legislative drafting Fantastic. That's a great skill set. If you see a lot of your job descriptions out of that collection of 30 jobs that you, you've pulled together, if you see a lot of them mention legislative drafting or knowledge of legislation or comparative legislation or anything like that, that's a skill you can add to your list of things that I need to put on my resume target list. And I can say, okay, I need to spend some time developing this skill set. Or global health. That's a substantive area. So rather than a Rather than a technical skill like legislative drafting, this is you know, knowing about global health, being aware of and trained on the issues that are relevant to the global health field in the world right now. Um, that's a very, very good skill that you can add to your list and say, OK, I'm going to do whatever I can to pursue that and to add that to what um, I have on my own resume and can say I'm qualified for. Um, it's very important that you never stop doing this. Developing skills is a lifelong requirement if you want to continue to advance in your career. You will never be able to walk into a job and say, I can do everything already that you want me to do. 
Um, one, that's going to be factually inaccurate just because they're going to have responsibilities and requirements that you just don't know about going into the job. Uh, and two, the reality is as an employer, I don't want someone who thinks that they can already do this job. I want someone who's going to grow into the position. I want someone who's going to learn and develop and actually be excited about staying with my organization over a period of months and years, hopefully. Um, right now, in, in the United States at least, the estimate is that it costs about 140 to 150 percent of a person's salary to hire that person. So if that person doesn't stay for at least a year and a half, um, then the company has actually lost money on that person because they spent more on trying to hire them in man hours, in um, or personnel time rather, in uh, cost of advertising, in um, processing all of the application and processing the, the hiring documents and stuff like that, then they actually get work out of that person and value of that person. So I want to know as an employer that someone's going to stick around, um, which means that I want someone who's going to grow into a position. So it's rare that you're going to have every skill set already locked up, which means that you're constantly going to need to be evaluating what skills do I need to add to my resume to make me a good candidate. Um, and one of the things that this allows you to do is you can get a large sample size that says, you know what, 25 out of the 30 jobs that I'm interested in say they want someone who can do legislative drafting. I'd better get some experience on that. I'd better find a way to work for a parliament or a Congress or something like that, or work for a policy organization that provides model legislation or something, um, because that's an important skill set that I need. And it may be that the international law job that you want that deals with legislative drafting is not available to you until you get some of that experience. So you may pursue a position with a domestic-based organization or one that focuses on a subject area that's not your specific subject area of interest because it gives you legislative drafting skills. Um, and so that may be the goal. You may spend three years somewhere working at a place specifically so that you can check that box that says, I now have legislative drafting skills rather than going right after the job that you initially wanted right out of law school because you don't qualify for it yet. Um, so sometimes, and, and we tell students this all the time in recent graduates, it usually takes three to five years, at least in the American job market and in international organizations. Um, it takes three to five years to be the quality lawyer that organizations want to hire in the interna international law field. So what does this look like in the job that we're looking at today? Um, well, this looks like these items on the uh, skill sheet um, that are clearly identified as skills. These are the ones that are as identified as skills um, and I want to point out one that we added here because it's a really interesting amalgam of a skill and an experience. But fluent and written, fluent written and spoken English, and the ability to produce high quality written material. That's great. That's basically the equivalent of saying we want research and writing skills, um, which is not the best. Excellent organizational skills, excellent interpersonal and communication skills, excellent IT skills, ex excellent attention to detail with proofreading and editing experience. Um, now, the reason I included that last one, because it says experience, but it's clearly identifying a skill set. Proofreading and editing is a skill set. They want someone who has those skills. Now, the, remember way back in the beginning, we talked about sometimes experience means time and position. You've done this for a certain number of years. Sometimes it means, do you have the skills? This is a great example of a situation in which they are asking for a skill set. Proofreading and editing is a skill set. And the way that they are asking for it is as experience. So when you're evaluating your job description, sometimes you'll run across something that says experience, but is actually a skill. And this is a great example of that. Um, now, one of the other things I want to draw your attention to, oh, and the under desirable skills, fluency in other languages. Um, that said, one of the things I want to draw your attention to is how under the essential skill, basically the required skills, you have to have these in order to apply, you have four of these that are um, not something that you get in law school directly. Organizational skills, interpersonal communication skills, IT skills, and proofreading and editing. These are not things that law school sets out to teach you specifically. You don't have a class on interpersonal and communication skills at law school, which means that when you're in law school or you've recently graduated, you need to be looking around for ways to develop these kinds of professional skills. These are skills that every professional is expected to have, um, but you need to find a way to demonstrate that you have them. There are any number of ways that this might come through. They can be things like working for student organizations, volunteering for nonprofits, um, setting up yourself in a way that can demonstrate 
yes, I am ex I have excellent organizational skills, and that may be because I run the calendar of volunteers for the local nonprofit that I work with on it can be as simple as like a soup kitchen that gives out free food to people and I manage whether or not people show up on time as volunteers for that. That's organizational skills. Um, interpersonal and communication skills. One of the great ways to do this is go and talk to primary and secondary students. Um, the, in America, we'd call them high school students. But if you need to get some public speaking and you've already graduated from law school, then volunteer at local high schools to come and say, hey, I'm willing to talk about my experiences in international law, or I'm willing to talk about the fact that uh, this decision just came down about the South China Sea, and what does that mean, and why should students care about it? Um, high school teachers are excited to get those kinds of, of outside voices in, and if you're willing to volunteer your time, you can often add examples of this that can then go on your resume to demonstrate that skill set. Um, so, uh, one of the things that, and, and this is a good example, let me jump back to the last slide here, because there are only a few things on skills here. There are only six items, and two of them are language-based, um, and we covered those earlier. So that doesn't actually help me a lot. There's actually not a lot of legal skills that are, that are mentioned here. So how do I actually dive into the meat of the job and say, look, I have skills in human rights. You didn't ask anything about this. Um, although we do have a, uh, we'll get to this in the experience section up above, um, but, uh, but there's limited amounts of legally relevant stuff here. So one of the things that you can do is find hidden skills in the duties and responsibilities section. So minimalist job descriptions are not an excuse to send in a light application package. You need to be studying the job description and figuring out what is it that they want me to apply with? What should I look like to be a good candidate in terms of my resume? Um, and the duties and responsibilities section can be very, very helpful in actually accomplishing this. So this uh, particular uh, job application includes these as responsibilities. Um, undertaking legal research and drafting legal briefs, advocacy, submission, and other legal documents. Well, right away, that solves one of the problems we talked about because they said, we want someone with good writing skills. Well, that's really vague. That doesn't help me. But if you look at the responsibility section, it says we're talking about writing legal briefs and advocacy submission. Well, that helps significantly because now I know that we're talking about writing for courtrooms, writing for the legal profession itself. Um, that gives me a lot of uh, meat that I can put together a good resume around and write a good cover letter around. Um, designing and implementing training components of capacity building projects in e equality law and human rights law. That's both substantive knowledge of equality law and human rights law and organizational and professional skills in terms of divine, designing and implementing training components. Now this is again a, a difficult thing to get early in your career, but you can do so by volunteering. Volunteer to set up a time at, at local community organizations, community colleges, um, churches, synagogues, mosques, uh, community centers, um, and do trainings. Uh, one of the things that I did before I came to ASOL when I worked in the University of Pittsburgh was I cooperated with a nonprofit in the city, um, and I went around and spoke at churches and synagogues and mosques and community centers on um, current events in international law. So when the uh, when the NATO invasion of Libya happened, I went around for a good six weeks, and like every week, I was giving a talk to a different group of community people about what does this mean, what is the international law behind this, what are the implications of this, how is this justified under NATO, all of those kinds of things, um, and answering their questions. That's training. That's that's absolutely conducting legal training, and you can do that voluntarily. You can sign those up and create those yourself. So don't be afraid to create own, your own opportunities. Um, overseeing and coordinating the work of external consultants and overseas partners. That's something that's going to be difficult to come by. Um, so you want to be identifying which of these you should spend your time on and which of these you shouldn't. Coordinating the research and drafting of country and thematic reports and drafting country and thematic reports. This is, again, Absolutely something you can do on your own, volunteer work. If you're still in law school, putting this together in a law school context, uh, working as a research assistant for a professor, any number of these. Um, so there's a lot of these, and you can look through the rest of these, uh, like managing interns, you know, getting supervisory experience is very important. Um, and the way that you do that depends on what resources you, and opportunities you have available to you, but they are things that you can undertake and should be looking at this and saying, okay, how can I add these skills 
to my own resume? How can I make my resume look like what they want? All right, so let's move on to experience because we've already talked about qualifications, we talked about skills, and now we'll talk about experience. So one of the things here is that time and position is often a, 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 a can be um, the requirement, but sometimes in experience is shorthand for skills. Um, this is a judgment call. This is a subjective evaluation. I can't give you a guideline or a rule book on how to do this. It's something you have to do on a case-by-case -case basis, but it is absolutely um, something that the more you study these job descriptions and the more you see of them, total number, you will get better at identifying which of these are real uh, time and position requirements and which of these actually want someone who can just do a certain skill and they assume that anyone who's done X job for three years knows how to do that. So use volunteer opportunities, student organizations, professional associations, summer semester internships as a way to build your experience similar to job descriptions you want to pursue. You need to target the things that you spent. Um, one of the unfortunate realities of the job market today is that, uh, especially in the legal field, is that there seems to be an expectation that you're going to spend some time after you graduate volunteering. Um, no one's yet come up with a good solution on how students and recent graduates are supposed to pay for this. Um, some law schools in the U.S. are actually providing public service and public sector scholarships for students who do this kind of volunteer work after they graduate. Um, but it's certainly a difficult process, and a lot of law graduates find themselves taking jobs that are not in line with the career that they want, but simply to pay the bills. So you need to be looking when you have to go after those kinds of jobs, what skills can I be adding to my resume because I'm doing this. If you're working at a small contract law firm, well, yeah, that's not international law, and maybe you don't get to work on the international subject that you wanted to, but if you're interested in getting into international business and international dispute resolution, knowing how contract law works is really good. Knowing how to write briefs and legal memoranda is very, very important. So all the skills that you can develop while you're in that position are still relevant and you should still be working on that in the experience that you are getting. So you want to make sure that your experience and your skills are tied together. Experience should always be getting you skills that you can add to your resume. Um, and this is difficult to evaluate, but let's look at this particular example. So on this job, these are the experiences that they list. Now, we talked already about the, the bottom of the essentials list. The last entry there is the excellent attention to detail with proofreading and editing experience. I included that on the skills section because proofreading and editing is a skill. That's something that they absolutely want to know that you can do. They use the word experience, but what they want is a skill. But if you look at the first one here where it says experience in a role which requires coordination of multiple projects and or work streams concurrently. All right. Now, this is both an experience requirement and, I would argue, a skill requirement. So what they want is someone who can do multitasking. This is basically a long way of saying, I want multitasking. That's a skill. So that's demonstrating a skill of multitasking. Now, this particular job description does not have year-based requirements on experience. So it doesn't say three years of experience in a role. But what it does say is experience in a role which requires, and I would argue that that means that they want a job where this was actually part of your responsibilities. That may not necessarily be a paid job. Um, it might very well be a volunteer position or a fellowship or something like that, but they want a, a, a day in, day out job that has required this, um, that you multitask and work on different projects at the same time. Um, You'll notice that I didn't highlight above that the demonstrable knowledge of international human rights and or equality law. Um, that is both, again, kind of an experience and a skill. They want, they want someone who knows international human rights law and they want a demonstration of that. That may be a skill set. Um, that may be the ability to talk specifically about how 1235 or 1503 procedures work in the UN, uh, the human rights uh, system there. That may be um, a, an experience-based thing. Uh, did you do a moot court competition in which human rights played a part? Well, I know you all did moot courts because you were all in Jessup. So were you one of the people that was uh, engaged in arguing on a human rights question? You can bring that in. If you look down at the desirable skills, um, we've got experience in a human rights organization. Absolutely, internship or fellowship or volunteer position qualifies you for that. Experience in organizing events. We've already talked about how your own um, work with volunteer organizations or student organizations can count for that. And fundraising experience. And, and a lot of law students balk at and graduates balk at this because it's coming quite common, especially in the 
the nonprofit sector, the human rights sector, um, where funding is, is an issue and is ongoing. Um, government and uh, private sector work don't often run, you don't run into this if you're pursuing careers there. But if you're pursuing on the public international law side, you, on the NGO market, you might run into this. Um, don't let this scare you off. You can get this kind of experience by volunteering with local organizations. I mean, I've had former students of mine who got this experience not through a legal organization, not even through a, a human rights nonprofit, but they worked with the local community library. And the local community library wanted to do um, some fundraising. And so they worked with the fundraising develop, the development committee is what it was called. Um, to get that experience, and they were able to add that to their resume. So there are other ways that you can go about this um, and make sure that you can add these things to your resume. Uh, finally, these are some things that are really important to remember when you're studying job descriptions. Remember that job descriptions are often wish lists, not must-haves. No employer expects every single item to be checked off on the candidate that comes in for the position. Um, in fact, uh, my own experience with hiring is I don't actually want someone who checks all of those off because I'm worried that they're going to walk into this position and be bored. We already talked about how important it is to get longevity in a position. You don't want someone leaving after just a year. Um, so I rarely go after the person who has everything checked, um, which means, leading us to the second one, you should be applying for jobs that are slightly above your current levels of, of skill or experience. You're One, you're going to be hurting yourself if you're only applying for jobs that you meet every qualification. Um, two, you need to be growing and stretching and, and developing your professional career. Now, eventually there may come a point where you land yourself in a job where you're like, you know what, I don't need to, I don't need to go anywhere from here. This is the job that I want to do or a job similar to this, so I've got the skill set that I need and it may just be changes of scenery or changes of topic that are important to you. Um, but at this point in your career, you need to be stretching. You need to be pushing and reaching for new kinds of jobs. Um, and I actually included this before Pokemon Go took off as all the rage because my nephew loves Pokemon, the TV show. Um, but you need to build a collection of job descriptions, hence the gotta catch them all uh, catchphrase. Um, even jobs that you can't apply for now will inform your choices about upcoming opportunities. So you absolutely need to be looking at the jobs you are applying for now, for what's going to you know put food on the table and help you pay your student loans down, um, and the job that you want three to five years from now so that you can make sure that the job you get today is actually helping you prepare for that. And if the job itself is not great, if it doesn't line up perfectly, then you know, okay, I need to be spending my volunteer time and my professional development time working on these skills that I'm not getting from my current day job. So you need to be deliberate and evaluate your um, skill set and your, your thought processes here. All right, um, so we're going to move on to a little bit of a technical thing, but I want to. We had a few more questions come in, and so I want to address these really quickly. Um, so first, uh, Chinmaya asks, "How does one go about navigating the idea of being a practitioner in international law? Is there any particular strategy for those interested in joining chambers or law firms should pursue?" Um, and the simple answer is, unfortunately, no. Um, I, every time I do one of these talks, I get asked. Tell me what to do. What are the what are the check box? What are the steps that I need to do? And the answer is it's different for every kind of career. For every kind of opportunity that you want to pursue, there are a different number of standards that you should go after. Um, so these are uh, these are an important part of pursuing um, an international job is evaluating what that particular career path wants from you, and that's why we recommend the job description method, where you actually get a large number of these job descriptions and let the employers tell you what they want. I can give you advice on specific areas and specific areas of practice in international law, but I can't do anything to help you um, without knowing the specifics of your own life. And your interests may change. They may You may decide, you know what, I've worked three years on this particular topic. I've, I've done three years on international trade, and really, I think dispute resolution is where I want to be, not just trade, but you know, specifically in the DR field. Um, that's a different skill set, and it's going to change. And you're not always going to have access to me or someone like me that can do that. So learning how to evaluate potential jobs for yourself and what avenue to take to get there is really important. That said, there are some things that I can tell you that you should always do. One, you should always be reaching out to any of the resources you have available. Professional membership associations are important because of this, because they have people like me 
And they also have just the members who are usually engaged and participating in international law um, to advise you on how they did it and what they did. Um, that can be less helpful than you would expect because international law as a profession has changed quite dramatically, um, even in just the last five or six years. Um, but it's still valuable to get advice from other individuals. Uh, second, you can be looking at um, the, the school you graduated from, the local organizations that you work for, any of your employers, and building up a mentoring connection of folks that can advise you on the things that you can go after. Um, so those are some of the ways that you can kind of try and work to put together a, a roadmap for a particular kind of practice area. Um, to answer your question specifically, Chinmaya, on legal practice in terms of law firms or chambers, those uh, types of organizations always very, very highly value um, research and writing skills. But again, that gets us back to the fact of what kind of research and writing, and that's going to depend on what kind of firm you're interested in and what kind of work they do. Uh, are we talking about appellate level stuff at international courts? Are we talking about trial level stuff in the domestic field? Are we talking about preparing foreign legal analysis of studying other countries' laws um, or international analysis of studying conventions and treaties? So that's going to change depending on the skill or depending on the, um, the focus of those kinds of organizations. Uh, another question that we got is um, whether one can remain actively involved in academia um, that, uh, while practicing international law, and if so, how to go about this. Um, and this question is from Devashir, Deva, Devashri. Devashri. Um, unfortunately, Devashri, this is not an easy question to answer because every country has different uh, customs when it comes to legal education and legal academia. So, for example, in the United States, doing too much practice of international law in certain fields will actually disqualify you or make you less of a good candidate for um, working at a law for, or law school, eventually being a law professor. Um, other types of international law, uh, they love having someone who's got experience and you know has done six or seven years in the real world and then switches over. Um, it's very difficult just because of the time commitments to be able to balance both, and that will depend significantly on the university involved. So when I was a law professor, I was teaching two classes and mentoring a bunch of students and running a bunch of programs. I did not have time to be practicing another job. My practice experience actually came from pro bono work. And twice a week, I worked with indigent clients. Um, uh, but that was, or once a week, um, I worked with indigent clients. Uh, but that was something I did on the side, on my own time. I could not have done that as a job. I could not have maintained another international law career. Um, frequently because the time investment to actually be a practicing lawyer competes with the time investment that it takes to be up to date on the international law topics and be teaching a class. Um, so it's very difficult to balance both, but the reality is it changes very dramatically from country to country, and I can't give you a specific example um, or a specific answer for your particular situation. Um, uh, Magdalena sent another question, do you know about any specialties of a career in international litigation or a job at an international court is aimed at? And I'm, I'm not sure I quite understand this. Um, I, I guess if I'm interpreting it right, it's saying, you know, do you need a particular subject matter expertise to pursue a job at an international firm or a job at an international court? Um, and if that's what the question is, then it, uh, again, the lawyer's favorite answer, it depends. Um, it depends on the type of practice that that court deals with. So for example, the permanent court of arbitration is obviously dealing with arbitration matters between, um, on, on commercial issues between actors. Um, whereas if you're arguing in front of the International Court of Justice, that's gonna be a different set of skills. And if you're arguing in front of the International Criminal Court, that's gonna be a different set of skills. Likewise for international firms that conduct international litigation. Um, depending on that firm, they might be doing stuff based on international intellectual property rights. They might be doing something based on contract law or dispute resolution and arbitration. Um, or they might be doing white collar crime or you know cross-border um, transactional work or any other number of issues that have foreign and, and international implications. There's, it's far too big of a field for me to be able to say, yes, this one skill is going to change everything. This one skill is going to make it valuable for you. Um, 
But that's why, again, you should be looking at the job descriptions. So if you want to work for the ICJ in the registrar's office or a clerk of the court, then you need to be looking at what they're asking for. What skill sets do they want? What experience do they want? What qualifications do they want? So that you can make yourself into a good candidate um, by developing those skills, those qualifications, and those experiences. So let's talk a little bit about what you do actually in the job application process. So we, um, we're going to very briefly cover cold contact emails because they're not as important in the job process as they are in internships and fellowships. But uh, with cold contact emails, um, and read this slide later, again, you'll be sent these. You want to know, you want to be very direct, get to the point, um, make sure you follow up. Don't let, uh, don't let a lack of a response um, depress you and, and divert you from pursuing it, but also know when to move on. And, and you need to make sure you're applying for multiple of internships or fellowships um, with these kinds of avenues. That said, let's move on to resumes. So um, one of the important things about resumes that people often get wrong is a resume is not a narrative statement. It is not telling a story. A resume is a checklist. It is a list of skills and qualifications and experiences that I as an employer can look at and say, does this person meet the requirements that I want? We already talked about the importance of knowing the vocabulary of this particular field, so make sure you use in your resume the language that the employer is using. Um, be direct. We're talking about bullet points here. No sentences, no objective statement. Get to the point of what the skill or the experience you have. Um, now, highlight what the job description asks for. Make sure you list experiences first. If you have real experience from during law school, let's say you were a clerk um, and got a, a academic credit for it. Let's say you worked at a clinic program and, and represented clients while still in law school. Don't put those under your education tab. Those are experiences. Break that out. If you've graduated law school, your experience section should be the first section on your resume. Absolutely, without a doubt, that is what you are now which means you need to have stuff to put in there. So you should be evaluating your resume and going, do I have enough experience to do that? I always encourage also um, people to list their work product and their skills under their experiences section. So rather than try and explain what you did on a day-to-day -day basis, which can be difficult, um, if you list the skills that you have from that job and you list what you did, the things that you actually produced, so you can point to a report that was written, you can point to a an application that was filed or an a, a appeal that was filed on behalf of a client. Um, you can point to a, a written product on a website somewhere. Those are very valuable things. Or you know, a program that you ran, a course that you taught, education that you've done. Um, list those kinds of things. Cover letters. Now, we talked about resumes are not narratives. Cover letters are. Cover letters are all about stories. So you need to be telling your story in your cover letter. So one, let's make sure that we've got the proper format. No bullet points. Your resume is your checklist, not your cover letter. So I don't want to see a list. I don't even want to see a long sentence that strings together, I'm good at this, 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 and this, when your resume could tell the same thing. There are two really important questions that your cover letter should address. Why do you want this job, and why should this employer want you? And those are the things that matter most in your cover letter. So you need to be talking about what about this job makes you excited. So do the research. Make sure you understand what this organization does. Make sure you know what the job is going to be like, the quality of life, the work environment, the skill set needed, all of that kind of stuff, and convey that. And then you need to sell yourself a little bit. You need to put yourself out there, and you need to say, hey, this is of importance to me. I want to be able to do this, and you should want me. This is what I bring to the table. Here's what I, here's what I offer. Here's what I add to this um, uh, to this position. And it's difficult, especially for young professionals, to put that together in a way that is confident but not arrogant. So don't be afraid to rewrite that element multiple times. Um, it's going to take work. A good cover letter is more than an hour or an hour and a half process. A good cover letter can take you a couple of days to put together. Um, now, keep all of your cover letters because you'll be able to adapt and apply certain parts of them to other things that you do later on. Finally. And we've got about five minutes before we finish, and I'll, I'll do one more quick look around at questions. Um, we've got uh, networking, and this is an important part of your professional development in pursuing a career in international law, um, just like any other type of professional skill set and professional work. Uh, you need to be looking at the tools of the trade. What do you need to have in order to effectively network? How do you handle happy hours and receptions? And what are your professional contacts? So first, networking, the tools of the trade, 
business cards. Even if you don't have a current job yet, get business cards. You need business cards. They are the international language of professionals. You need to have a business card. Um, if you are going to use your personal email, make sure your email makes sense. Don't be, you know, I, I have to say this because, and people always laugh, but I have seen parties all night um, at gmail.com as an email. That's not a, a good one to use on your business card. Um, so make sure it's your professional name. The standard is, you know, first name dot last name or first two initials and last name or something like that. So use something tame, something very specific. I also recommend that people use it as a dedicated email. Have an email that is just your personal email that you use for professional networking so that you don't have that as what you give out to your family and your, you know, your aunt is sending you all of these email chains that forwards along with pictures of ducks and whatever. Don't worry about that on your professional one. Have an email set aside specifically for that. Um, when I say use both sides of the business card, I mean take notes. When you finish talking with someone, make sure you write down what you talked with them about so that when you follow up, you can actually reference those things. Join a professional membership association. You're already in the American Society of International Law. That's great. There are any number of others. There's foreign professionals, uh, the Foreign Professional Association. Um, there's Young Professionals in Foreign Policy. There's the ABA section on international law. There's the International Bar Association. There's the International Law Association. There's any number of them. Pick one, join one, make sure you get involved. And that leads us to our second, which is volunteer activities. Write for or um, uh, participate for in nonprofits, community outreach, religious organizations, anything that you can do to be adding those skills to your resume. Um, you'll also develop a good network of contacts. Not all of them will be international lawyers, but sometimes that's very, very helpful. Um, there are quite a number of my former students who have gotten jobs because of non-law persons seeing a legal job posting and passing it along to them. So don't just focus on the lawyers in the professional membership association. Get out into other volunteer organizations as well. Professional writing, ACL Insights, Opinio Juris, Jurist, all of these are great ways to write short pieces with a quick turnaround time where you can demonstrate that you're up to speed on a specific skill set and you have good writing skills and can work under a deadline and have uh, can be edited and all those kinds of things. There's a great opportunity to do that. Check those out online. Look for other places. If you have language skills, write in that language as well, in, in another language besides English. Um, uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but there is a way to prepare for happy hours and receptions to make sure that your networking is effective. Um, you know, it involves researching your speakers, identifying the areas that, of interest that they speak in, and create questions on likely topics related to the event. When you actually meet them, make sure you keep it simple. Um, don't speak for longer than 90 seconds with the person you're trying to network on the first time. You don't want to be that person who takes up 10 minutes of the person's time and there's a line behind you of other people trying to talk to the speaker. Um, make sure that you exchange business cards. Make sure you have an exit line prepared so that you can move on. My strong recommendation is that when you go, you actually have an empty cup or glass in your hand so that when you are at the point where you want to finish, you can say something along the lines of, it's been great talking to you. I really enjoyed this conversation. I need to get another drink. I hope you have a great night. Um, and then you move on. And then you follow up. You maintain and follow up with that person. And there's a lot of ways that you can do that. And we have more detail about that in our, um, in our career handbook. But specifically, you need to remember that when you're dealing with a professional contact, your goal is to um, identify the person you want to go after, open an avenue of communication. That's what business cards are so helpful is because they exchange that contact information. You want to create two-way flow of information. So you don't want to just be have this be you reaching out. You want them to be engaging as well. And then you want to develop a mentoring relationship eventually. That's, that's the ultimate goal of trying to do that. Um, uh, final, oh, uh, wrong. There we go. Um, you need to continue doing your career development. It is not a finite activity. Um, so use some of the resources you have to continue to work on your professional development. Um, you have access to your own law school. Even if you've graduated, the Career Services supports its alumni. Keep in touch with your professors, professors, the ones who taught you. Many of them have great contacts around the world. You need to be leveraging those and taking advantage of those. Have your professional network, your professional membership associations. Um, you're a member of ASIL, so this is a great opportunity for you, but you've also got the career guide, which is a much more in-depth guide about these topics and these, uh, this information that you can use to potentially find more things to, uh, to develop and work on in your own professional skill set. And finally, 
get started now. Now, most of you are already actually members, um, but if you haven't joined the society yet, make sure you follow up with Sheila Ward and our, our professional development or our um, membership team here um, to do that. But take advantage of what ASIL has. You have access to our job board that has hundreds of fellowships and internships, writing contests and moot court competitions. Um, take a look at our YouTube channel and our video content on our website. There's plenty of information there. Um, and check out the ASIL annual meeting. Uh, this year there were over 1,200 lawyers from around the world here in DC for four days. It's a great opportunity to learn more on substantive areas of international law and also to network and to develop professional contacts around the world. So um, that's everything that we've got uh, on this now. Um, I hope that you found this all interesting. You've got the events at ASIL.org uh, email account, so be, feel free to email us questions after the fact. We will follow up. For those of you who emailed us, we will actually distribute the slides as well. Um, and you can make sure to, to follow up with more questions when you've had a chance to review those too. Uh, I hope you found this interesting. We're very excited to have all of our ILSA graduates as part of the society now. And we hope that you'll find a home here as you pursue your career in international law. Thank you and have a great day.